Hey, welcome everybody. Great to have you guys here at all three of our Parker Hill locations. And let me give a big shout out to those of you who may be watching online right now as well from living rooms and hotel rooms and dorm rooms on college campuses, coffee shops, wherever you happen to be. And if you are watching online, we'd love to have you join us in person for the full experience if you live within a 20 minute drive of one of our locations. But it's a great weekend to be here at church because today we are kicking off a brand new four week teaching series called Margin. And for today and the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about how to live a life of peace and joy in a world that tends to be very busy and very chaotic. You know, we live in this world where there are so many things that are competing all the time for our time and our attention. So many things that are begging for space in our schedules and in our budgets and in our hearts. And it can be overwhelming sometimes. In fact, I want to give you a picture of how a lot of people live these days, myself included sometimes, and it comes from one of my favorite theologians, Dr. Seuss. Uh, When I was a kid growing up, I used to love to read Dr. Seuss books, and so when I became a father, uh, we had Dr. Seuss books, and I would read them to my kids, and so I brought along one of my favorite Dr. Seuss books. It's called The Cat in the Hat. And years ago, I was reading this to my daughter, and I came across this passage, this section in the book that I thought was really, really insightful. And I know that's why you guys come to Parker Hill, is for these deep theological insights. And so I want to give you one today, uh, Dr. Seuss, baby, cat in the hat. So here's how it goes. Here's what the cat said. Um, Look at me, look at me, look at me now. It is fun to have fun, but you have to know how. I can hold up the cup and the milk and the cake. I can hold up these books and the fish on a rake. I can hold the toy ship and a little toy man. And look, with my tail, I can hold a red fan. I can fan with a fan as I hop on the ball. But that is not all. No, that's not all. Now, I think this is a picture of the way that far too many people live their lives these days. Uh, For some of you, this is your schedule. You just keep adding one more thing, one more thing to an already busy schedule to the point where you have no time to relax, no time just to be with the people that you love, no time to enjoy a sunset. And the busier you get, the more irritable you get, and the more uh, tired you get from trying to balance everything. You've gotten to the point where you resent your kids for all the sports they play that you signed them up for. You know, for some of you, this is your schedule. Uh, For some of you, this is your finances. Like you just keep buying more and more stuff and charging more and more stuff. And now in your life, you're trying to manage all of these financial demands. For some of you, that's a pretty good picture of your brain because you're always connected And your brain is constantly inundated with information and entertainment, whether it's YouTube or Instagram or Netflix or Facebook or email or whatever it might be. And there's no time for reflection. There's no no time for your soul to really breathe. See, this is what life looks like, I think, in today's world for way too many people. But this is not sustainable. In fact, let me turn the page in the cat in the hat. That is what the cat said. Then he fell on his head. He came down with a bump from up there on the ball, and Sally and I, we saw all the things fall. In other words, if we try to live life like that, we end up paying the price. Some things are going to fall apart. You're going to pay the price emotionally because it's just going to take a toll on your heart. You're going to pay the price relationally because when you live like that, trying to balance everything, There's no real time to build relationships. And and I think most importantly of all, we pay the price spiritually because busyness is the primary distraction from our pursuit of a relationship and an understanding of God. And so many people today, as I observe it, so many people today live overloaded, maxed out, hyper busy lives. And I think this is a bigger problem today than it ever has been before in human history. In fact, let me give you some statistics about how our lives have changed over the years. Let's think, first of all, about sleep habits, okay? Before 1879, the average American got 11 hours of sleep per night. Do you know why the year 1879 is important? That's when Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. And that began to change everything. Before that, you know, people would sleep. Can you believe it? 11 hours a night. Can you even imagine that? 
By 1950, that had decreased to eight hours. Currently, it is seven hours on average and still declining. We don't have time to sleep. What about work? What about our work patterns? In 1967, a Senate subcommittee held hearings on the issue of retirement. One of the experts in those hearings testified that by 1985, advances in technology would allow most Americans to have a 22-hour work week. That didn't quite work out that way, did it? In fact, just the opposite, in 1967, the average full-time employee worked 43.3 hours per week. Today, the average full-time employee works 46.7 hours per week. We're sleeping less and working more than we ever have before. And then you add into all of that technology, which has radically changed our lives in the last 25 to 30 years. The average child at age six today will have invested more hours watching video content then he will spend talking with his father over his entire lifetime. The distraction of technology. The average, get this, the average iPhone user touches his or her phone 2,617 times a day. Every click, every swipe, every type on the keypad, over 2,000 times a day. It wasn't that long ago that none of us had smartphones. And none of us had access to Wi-Fi, but now we can't imagine living without those things. And we are so immersed today in the digital world that it grabs our attention and it holds us hostage. And the end result of all of this is that we live in a world full of people who are overloaded, maxed out, hyper busy, and constantly distracted. In fact, let me make some predictions about the year 2020. I'm not a fortune teller. I'm not a prophet, although I work for a nonprofit. But I can say this there will be moms and dads this year who will not be the parents that they really want to be. There are going to be some Christians in 2020 who won't use the gifts that God has given to them to do good kingdom work in this world. There are going to be marriages this year that will become more and more distant and less and less fulfilling. There are going to be followers of Christ in 2020 who don't reach the spiritual potential they could reach. And all of that will happen, not because people defy God, not because we turn our backs on him, but just because we are so busy, so distracted, and so overwhelmed. And so we're going to spend the next four weeks learning how to live a little bit differently. And I'll give an honest confession. Um, This particular series is one that I need as much as anybody else, okay? Because I struggle with this. I I tend to, to, to be very restless when I'm not doing something. Uh, I tend to overcommit to too many things. I tend to be a bit of a work of a, of a workaholic, and even pay the price for that in my health. And so this is this is something that that I'm struggling with along with you. So we're going to go on this journey together for the next four weeks. And I hope you'll be here all four weeks because I think what we learn together will help make this a better year and maybe even make better lives for all of us. So the title of this series, Margin, it actually comes from a book by the same name that was written by Dr. Richard Swenson. And uh, Dr. Swenson is a medical doctor, but he got tired of constantly writing prescriptions for stress-related illnesses, and so he wrote a book about stress called Margin, and it's really one of the best books out there. And uh, let me read just a part of the introduction from the book. He says this, Life in modern-day America is essentially devoid of time and space, not the Star Trek kind, the sanity kind. The time and space that once existed in the lives of people who lingered after dinner, visited with neighbors, sat on the porch swing, worked in their garden, went for long walks, and always had a full night's sleep. People are exhausted. Like the mother of four from LaGrange, Illinois, who said, I'm so tired, I look forward to a trip to the dentist. I just can't wait to sit in that chair and relax. I I would suggest to you that if you're looking forward to going to the dentist just so you can relax, then you're probably too busy. You don't have enough margin in your life, okay? This is the way that uh, Dr. Swenson defines margin in the book. Margin is the space between our load and our limits. It is the amount available beyond what is needed. Margin is the space between breathing freely and suffocating. That's margin. And really, the the idea of margin is fairly common. We see it in a lot of areas of our lives. When you open a book, there's the text in the middle of the page, but around the edge, there's what's called the what? 
the margin, yeah, because the publishers who print the book, they don't run, they don't run the typeset all the way out to the edges because it makes it too hard to read that way. It's just kind of irritating. Uh, we have margin on our highways, right? We, we have not six inches on each side of our car, but six feet on each side of our car because we like margin when we're driving. We want a lot more pavement than is actually needed. Margin is why people pay extra money to fly in first class instead of coach, right? Because you got more personal space, more leg room, uh, seats are bigger. In, in the world of physical things, we like margin. We look for margin, but so many times when it comes to our finances, our schedules, our emotions, we push everything right to the limit and we live marginless lives and we end up paying the price for that. Uh, another way to understand margin is to understand maybe the opposite of it. I heard this phrase recently, hurry sickness. Uh, hurry sickness. I, I didn't make that up. That's a phrase that's more and more commonly used by psychiatrists to describe what's becoming a common problem in our culture today. Uh, let me give you a couple of definitions. This is one from uh, Philip Zimbardo, who's a psychologist at uh, at UCLA, he says, uh, hurry sickness is a malaise in which a person feels chronically short of time and so tends to perform every task faster and get flustered when encountering any kind of delay, like the idiot at the traffic light who doesn't move immediately when it turns green. There's a word for that now. The time between when the light turn green, turns green and the person behind you honks, the word for that is honkosecond because you get flustered because of hurry sickness when, when you encounter any kind of delay. Here's another definition. This is from Dr. Meyer Friedman. He said, a continue, hurry sickness is a continuous struggle and unremitting attempt to accomplish more and more things or participate in more and more events in less and less time. Uh, as a culture, we have no margin. We're afflicted with hurry sickness. We live in this world that seems to be obsessed with speed cramming more and more things into less and less time. See, we used to dial our phones, now we speed dial. We used to read, now we speed read. We used to walk, now we speed walk. We used to date, now there's speed dating. I mean, we traded the good life for the fast life. We're always moving, that's life without margin. But there's some consequences to this. So let me tell you what happens when you live a life without margin for too long, when you're filled with hurry sickness. Number one consequence is this, our emotions become strained. Because whenever your margin decreases, your anxiety increases, like you're sitting at a traffic light and you've got to be at a meeting in 20 minutes and, and, and the traffic in front of you is at a standstill. And then it's 19 minutes and 18 minutes and 17 minutes. And as, as your time margin decreases, your anxiety increases, right? Or think about financially, maybe your finances are, are in such shape that you can barely pay the, the bills. And one unexpected financial hit takes away all your margin and your stress goes way up. You know, when you, when you think about your emotional well-being, think of it like a tachometer. Uh, a tachometer is what shows your engine speed. And almost every tachometer at the high end of it ha has what's called the red zone. And uh, you can run the engine in the red zone. It's just not very good to do that because it puts a lot of strain on the engine. Now, there are times when you've got to put the engine into the red zone, like when you're passing an 18-wheeler and you need to get by. But if you drive with your engine speed in the red zone all the time, it's just going to break it down. Something's going to go wrong because it wasn't meant to live there. And if we live our lives constantly without margin, our emotions, our adrenaline is always in that red zone. We'll come back to this verse in a little while, but I love what it says here in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Better one handful, one handful of activity, one handful of success, one handful of stuff. Better one handful with tranquility, with peace, than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. See, marginless living leads to emotions becoming strained. But the second thing that happens is this, our relationships become shallow because the busier we get, the shallower our relationships become. Because when we don't have margin in our lives, we don't have the time or energy to invest in other people. We don't love like we should. We don't listen like we should. We don't engage like we should. 
It's impossible to have meaningful relationships when you're always moving 90 miles an hour. Relationships happen best in the margins. Relationships happen best when there's unstructured time, when you're relaxed, when you can just sit back and enjoy the moment. There's this interesting passage toward the beginning of the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy that describes how uh, those of us who are parents need to pass on uh, our faith and our values to the next generation. Listen to what this says. This is Moses speaking to the people of Israel. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Then listen to this. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Can you picture the lifestyle that's being described there? You know, how often today as parents do we just sit down with our kids or just go for a walk, just talk to them about our faith and our values? How, how often do we have that kind of unstructured time? A few years ago, got an email from a dad in our church and uh, he gave me permission to share it in a message and I I thought it was a great example of this it won't be on the screen I'll just read it for you he said this he said a couple of years ago we took a family vacation out west I had to go to a conference and I thought it would be nice for my wife and daughter to go along we would spend an extra few days after the conference and tour the state of New Mexico When we were getting on the plane to return home, I was reflecting on what a nice trip this had been. I asked my daughter, Erica, what was the best part of the trip for you? Of course, being the prideful father, I was thinking to myself, was it being able to take such a nice vacation out west? Was it one of the hotels we stayed in? Was it touring the Pueblo Indian ruins or Carlsbad Caverns? What would it be? Finally, Erica answered, Dad, It was that couple hours the night we had to make that drive up that two-lane road from Texas. You remember when we were all being silly and making up words and singing to whatever song was on the radio? I was humbled. That drive had been a blur in my mind. I remember some very out-of-tune harmonies and goofy ad-lib lyrics, but suddenly the drive assumed much more significance to me. We had traveled thousands of miles, seen glorious sights, ate well, and stayed in fine accommodations. But the most memorable part of the trip was not where we were, but that dynamic of being in the moment with my daughter. See, relationships happen in the margins. And if we don't have margin in our lives, we'll never have relationships. Our emotions get strained. Our relationships become uh, shallow. But the third thing that happens when we have marginless lives is that our souls become shriveled because just like it takes time to have a meaningful relationship with another person, it takes time to have a meaningful relationship with the God who created us. And when you run out of margin and we keep adding more and more and more stuff to our lives, then eventually what happens is you squeeze God out of your life and pretty soon your soul becomes empty. It's not being fed and you shrivel up spiritually. Jesus one day tells a parable, and in this story, he describes a farmer who goes out to scatter seed, and the seed, as he scattered it, fell on different kinds of soil, four different kinds of soil. And one of the types of soil that the seed fell on was soil that was filled with all kinds of weeds and thorns, and Jesus describes here what that means, Matthew chapter 13. He said, the one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life And the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. You know, every once in a while, I I run into somebody who at one time was very engaged in their faith, but is not so much anymore. And, you know, when I talk to them, hardly ever does somebody say, yeah, you know, as I thought about it and as I really studied it, I decided it wasn't true. I never hear that. Do you know what I always hear? Yeah, I was really engaged at one time in my faith, but then I got busy. I just got busy, and I didn't have time anymore, and eventually I just kind of drifted away from the whole thing. See, that John Ortberg, he says it this way. He says, for many of us, the greatest danger is not that we will renounce our faith. It is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we settle for a mediocre version of it. See, there are consequences to living your life without margin, to being afflicted with hurry sickness. There are emotional and relational and spiritual consequences to that. But the good news is we don't have to live our lives that way. 
In fact, God, our Heavenly Father, invites us into a very different way of living. And we're going to talk about that today and over the next few weeks, how we can find the cure for hurry sickness, how we can create some margin in our lives. And in the weeks to come, we're going to talk about some very, very practical ideas and try to give you some really good tools and really good strategies. But for the rest of our time that we have today, I just want to get to the heart issue behind all of this. What is the root of the issue when it comes to our busyness and distraction? What is it that drives us to fill our time with endless activity? What is it that drives us to surround ourselves with constant noise and distraction? What is it that drives us to say yes to every single thing that comes along? And if I could narrow it down, I think we might be able to trace it back to an acronym that became popular uh, about 15 years ago. It's this four-letter word, this four-letter acronym, FOMO. Do you know what that stands for? It stands for the fear of missing out. In fact, here's how that is defined on Wikipedia. Uh, The fear of missing out is a pervasive apprehension that others might be having rewarding experiences from which one is absent. In other words, I fear that I'll miss out on something if I don't say yes. I fear that I'll miss out on something if I don't check my Facebook page in the middle of the night. I fear that my kids will miss out on something if I don't sign them up for every activity under the sun. And so it is our fear of missing out, I believe, that drives us to chase and chase and chase and hurry and hurry and hurry and add and add and add. And the fear of missing out, by the way, has some sibling fears, like the fear of falling behind. Uh, You know, I'm not where I should be by now. I'm not where my dad was when he was my age. I'm not where some of my friends are at this point in their lives, this fear of falling behind or the fear of not mattering. I want to get to the end of my life and I want people to miss me. I want to have made a difference in this world. I want my life to count for something, and all of that's good, but the problem is that we, we connect busyness with mattering, and we think the busier that we are, the more important we are to this world, or the, the fear of disappointing others. I don't want to let my parents down. I don't want to let my spouse down. I don't want to let my kids down, and so driven by fear, we chase and chase and chase, and we add and add and add, and we hurry and we hurry, and we hurry. But here's the thing, the fear of missing out, that's, that's not a new thing. The Bible, hundreds of years ago, talked about the fear of missing out. In fact, for just a few minutes, I want to draw your attention to a passage in a book of the Bible called Ecclesiastes. This is in the old, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And Ecclesiastes was written by one of the kings of Israel. His name was Solomon. And Solomon is described in the Bible as the wisest man who ever lived. And the book of Ecclesiastes is just a collection of Solomon's observations about this world and how to have perspective on the things of this world. And in chapter 4, he says some powerful things, I think, about what drives our busyness, what drives our hurry sickness. Listen to this, verse 4. He says, I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. I mean, that is profound. He's just kind of standing back and observing human behavior. And he says, here's what I see. I see people looking to the right and looking to their left and seeing what other people are doing and comparing other people's lives with their lives. And I think if Solomon were here today, he would say, you know, sometimes we buy the clothes we buy, not because we need them, but because we want people to notice us. We buy the houses we buy, not because we need that much house, but because we want to look like we're moving up in the world. We engage in the activities we engage in because we don't want to be left out. We live at the pace we live at because that's the pace that everyone else is living at, and we don't want to be perceived as a slacker, right, because we wear our busyness like a badge of honor. You know, maybe the best analogy I found for the way that we live these days is, is this, a NASCAR race, right? Where everybody's just trying to keep up and outrun everybody else. But at the end of the day, we're just going in circles, right? Uh, by the way, I, I learned recently what NASCAR stands for. I didn't know this. Um, I, somebody just told me this the other day. Apparently, NASCAR stands for 
non-athletic sport centered around rednecks. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. It might be true. I don't think it's true. But there is some evidence that that might be true because we, uh, there's that right there. Now, y'all know I'm just kidding, right? I don't want to make all the NASCAR fans angry and have them send emails or throw beer at me or whatever. But NASCAR is kind of a picture of the way we live sometimes, right? We put the metal, pedal to the metal. We're going as fast as we can. We're trying to keep up with everybody else, just trying to get ahead of the pack. And eventually, sometimes we crash. But even if we don't, we just have this odd feeling in our hearts that all we're doing is just driving in circles. Listen to Solomon's verdict when he, when he talks about living that way. I saw that all toil and achievement spring from one person's envy of another. And then he says this, this, is, this too is meaningless. It's a chasing after the wind. Because what happens when you try to chase after the wind? You can't catch it. There's, there's no finish line. There's no sense of satisfaction. There's no peace. There's no tranquility because there's always something more out there, something bigger, something better, something newer, something trendier. Solomon says, all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of, of another. This too is meaningless. We're chasing after the wind. Now, you might look at that and you might think to yourself, well, come on, Solomon. Are you saying that we're just supposed to fold our hands and sit back and do nothing? Are you saying that I should just, you know, quit my job? and sell my house and grow a beard and learn to play guitar and live out of my minivan? Is that what you're saying? Is that what I'm supposed to do? Well, Solomon, he kind of anticipates and then answers that question in verse 5. He says, fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. In other words, Solomon says, don't think for a minute I'm telling you not to be ambitious. I don't think for a minute I'm telling you not to leverage your potential and become the best person you can be. The answer is not to sit back and fold your hands and do nothing. That would be foolish. He says, be engaged, work hard, find meaningful pursuits. But then he says this, and this is a beautiful statement of balance. Better one handful, one handful of activity, one handful of success, one handful of money, better one handful with tranquility, with a peaceful life, than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. We should work hard. We should pursue achievement. We should find meaningful things to do and to fill our schedule, but then be willing to set all of that aside so that we can turn off the technology, create some margin, love the people in our lives, and serve and worship God. Solomon goes on. He keeps going. He says this in verse 7. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. In other words, this was somebody who didn't have anyone he needed to support financially. There was no end to his toil. He worked day and night, and yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. Solomon is describing somebody who gives his entire life to working and working and accumulating and being busy and being active, but never has time to love or serve anyone else. And then he gets to the end of his life and he looks back and hears his assessment of that. For whom am I toiling, he asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? And then Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, steps back and he says, this too is meaningless, a miserable business. In other words, busyness, just for the sake of busyness, is a miserable business. Busyness, just for the sake of being busy, is a miserable business. It's not the way to live. There's much more to life than that. So let me, kind of, before I wrap up, give you a preview of what's coming up in the next few weeks. And so next week, as we continue, we're going to talk about time and how we see time and how we manage time and how we prioritize the things that will matter ultimately in our lives. And, and we're gonna be very practical about some time management things. And then week number three, week number three, we're going to focus on how our lives have changed living in the digital world surrounded by technology. And we're gonna talk about not how to be indestructible, but how to be indistractable. How to really engage in relationships, how to engage in your calling, without constantly being sucked away by all the stuff of this world now that distracts us. And then week number four, we're gonna talk about breathing room. Like how do you create time and space in your life 
just to allow God to breathe into your heart, to breathe into your soul? What are, what are some of the habits and some of the practices that we can adopt that will allow us to do that? Okay, now one of the things that we hope you'll do is we hope that you'll keep learning after you leave church. And so here's a resource for you if you wanna stop by the Next Steps area. There's a card that goes along with this series and on the back um, you'll, you'll find a link to a website and also some QR codes that'll hook you up with what we call our app notes which is a daily devotional that we deliver by email every day to think about this topic in about a 10 minute reading. There's also a link to Right Now Media, which is like Netflix with Christian content. And so there's a series on net Netflix about how to build a life that allows for margin. And then version is a, a digital uh, Bible app that you can get on your phone. And there's a reading plan that goes along with this as well. So if you wanna grab one of those on your way out, that would be a great next step. Now, as we wrap up, I wanna leave you with one word. And this one word, I believe, is the word that will cure our hurry sickness and create margin in our lives. But this one word is a word that we will find very difficult to say in our culture today. And it's this word right here, enough. And if we don't get good at using this word, we're gonna drift into marginless living. And our emotions are gonna pay the price and our relationships are gonna pay the price and our hearts are gonna pay the price. So we gotta get good at saying the word enough. So let me tell you how that might work. So maybe this week you're scrolling through Instagram just before you go to bed at night and you wanna see what everybody on your Instagram feed is doing. And so you're gonna say to yourself, I've seen enough. Or maybe you're sitting on the couch and Netflix is about to autoplay the next episode of the TV show that you've been binging on for the last three hours and you're gonna say, I've watched enough. Or maybe you're about to put one more thing in your Amazon shopping cart even though you've got a house full of stuff and you've got credit cards that are almost maxed out and so you're gonna say, I've spent enough. Or maybe you're about to sign up your kids for yet one more extracurricular activity. And if you do that, it'll mean that you have four nights a week that you eat in your car instead of three. And so you're going to say to yourself and your kids, hey, we've done enough. Or maybe you're at work and it's five o'clock and it's time to go home, but your work isn't done. So you're going to stay a couple of more hours, miss dinner and be late for your son's swim meet. And so you're going to say to yourself, I've worked enough. See, this is, this is a word that we have to get good at saying. And I think the reason why we sometimes keep ourselves so preoccupied and so busy is that we're trying to fill an emptiness inside of our hearts. We're trying to prove something. We're trying to show that we matter. And here's the thing. I think it's our emptiness that sometimes drives our busyness. And so what gives us the power to say enough to all the distractions and all the busyness in our lives is when we can say this, that he is enough. That I don't need all the stuff of this world to make me feel important or fulfilled. That in a relationship with my heavenly father who loves me unconditionally, when I drink deeply of that truth, when I embrace that relationship, when I live in that truth, when I lean into that truth, that then becomes enough so that all the other stuff that I try to distract myself with and, 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 and all the other stuff that I use to keep busy, that isn't as, impeal, as appealing anymore. And so we're gonna end our time together today w- with a song called Lord, I Need You because there's so many things in this world that we think we need that we really don't need and ultimately the only thing that we need is God himself, he is enough. As the, as the band comes and as they set up, Just watch this video with me.